Welcome everyone to the Asian Pacific Voices Radio, where you'll find stimulating conversations that explore diverse topics and stories impacting our communities. I'm your host today, Sheena Yap Chan. Joining me today is our special guest, Robin Sassy. Robin Sassy is a woman of many talents. She is the president and CEO of San Diego Music Studio since 1994. She's also the founder of the Philippines Ukulele Project that connects donors to children at risk in impoverished areas internationally, bringing music, education, and inspiration to a global level. Additionally, she is also a licensed attorney. Hi, Robin. Welcome to the show. How are you today? Hi there. Thank you. It's so nice to be on, and it's a great day. Awesome. Well, I'd love to hear a little bit about you know your upbringing, if you were born in the U.S. or if you migrated from the Philippines. Uh, I was actually born here in uh, the United States. My mother's an immigrant. She grew up in the Philippines, and she grew up in poverty. She was the oldest of five, and she was responsible for raising the children um, as a teenager. So she ran away from home, actually, as a teenager because she wasn't expected to go to school. She was expected to stay home and take care of the children. Uh, well, she took care of that. She found some Christian missionaries, which uh, took her in as a maid and allowed her to go to school. And then at some point, they were coming back to the United States and they said they could bring one person. They could bring either the cook or they could bring the maid. Well, the cook had already gone, so they decided to bring the maid instead, which was my mother. So she came to the United States. She went to school here, and that's where she met my father. And now my mom has retired back in the Philippines, and I was just back there to visit her just uh, just a couple months ago. Well, that's amazing. I'm also from the Philippines, and I literally just got back last month to oh, visit wonderful. friends and family. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's it's beautiful. It's like it's like going home, even though I wasn't born there. It, it's like going home. Yeah, and the beaches are amazing. So oh, <laughs> we have yeah. something in common. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd love to know a little bit about San Diego Music Studio. Now you've had this since 1994, which is amazing. First of all, but you know, what was that constant? What what made you start um, the music studio? Studio. What was the inspiration? I mean, it, was music something you grew up with? Yes, um, music was something I grew up with. My mother was very firm about getting an education, um, and she was also very firm about having us uh, having all of us study um, the classics. So we grew up on the golden age musicals. We all had dance. We did music instruments, um, beauty pageants, that sort of thing. She was very into that and really served me well later on. I think I had always wanted to have a music store. And my uncle told me that when I was little, I used to block off the living room and tell people it was a music store. And they had to pay to come in to the living room because that was my music store. So years later, I ended up starting one and. um Unfortunately, I don't collect money from people at the door. <laughs> that was wishful thinking, I guess, when I was younger. <laughs> I love that you mentioned you used to have a music store as a child, and then you made it happen. Yeah. Um, you know, what were the steps for you to, you know, creating something you had as a child to, you know, making it reality as an adult? Because I know that's not something that's typical, especially in like Filipino culture. It's like. You're either told to be a nurse <laughs> most of the time, go get a good job and just never rock the boat. But, you know, you you had this passion for music. You grew up with music and then you opened the studio. Right. What what would you know, what were the steps to that? Right. It's, and it's very interesting that you bring up the nursing thing, because uh, my mother said that to me when I was a young adult. She says, why don't you go to nursing school? And I was actually very offended because I thought nursing school, shouldn't she say that I should go and become a doctor? Uh, well, that didn't happen. Uh, but I was teaching music when I was very young in high school. And then I continued teaching through college. And by the time I was graduating from college, I already had a full studio and I was making a, a, a very good salary just teaching privately. So the music store evolved naturally after that, because then I'm thinking, well, how can I save money? I can sell the books to the students. I can sell pianos to the students. Then I started doing after school programs, got a brick and mortar, and then it just grew from there organically. I love that. And it's been almost, what, 30 years since you've had it? 
Isn't that crazy? (laughs) It's crazy. I don't like to think about it like that, but yeah, it's been almost 30 years. It's been, um, it's, it's been a force in San Diego. We're a community based music store. It's the place where people come and hang out. And at this point we've had students come back as adults and have their children take over here. And, um, it's just nice to see this, this cycle of learning and community spirit that has really come from this store. I love that. I mean, community is huge, right? I mean, yes. for me personally, I don't believe in self-made. I believe it takes a community, right, to support you, to buy your services and products. I mean, for you also, almost 30 years as a music store, and you've gone through, you also went through the pandemic. I mean, what was that like? <laughs> well, people handle um, stressful situations in different ways. Uh, for me, I had a great time during the pandemic. It was a time when I felt extremely useful And I had purpose during that time. People um, in our musical family, we have tons of students here. And at that time, we had close to 300 students and their parents, plus people who rented from us, teachers in the community that we serviced. And as soon as things were shutting down, people were calling, "What, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And I remember in particular this one mother that came in, and she was Asian, and of course, very, very concerned about her children and what's going to happen with their schooling. And she said, what's going, what's going to happen? They're missing school. They're missing school. They're missing lessons. They're going to be behind. And I looked at her and I said, the whole world will be behind. We're going to be okay, and we're going to get through this. So for me, the pandemic gave... Um, me an opportunity to become more of a leader in my community and to help others get through that difficult time. And so for me, I felt, I felt like I had purpose. And when you have purpose, uh, I think you feel like every day is a blessing. That's so true. You know, having a purpose is important because when times are tough, like being locked down for almost two years, like we have to you know, push through it, right? And especially as an entrepreneur, as a visionary, you're going to have pushback, you're going to have challenges, you're going to go through some crazy things, but you're still here today, the school, the music school is still open, and you still have a great community that supports you along the way and has been supporting you since 1994, which is really amazing. And just, I just want to congratulate that because, you know, that's not an easy thing to do, right? To be open for almost 30 years, like that's amazing. You know, a lot of people actually closed down during the pandemic you know, places that have been around for 30, 40 years. So yeah. um, I wanted to ask you about the Philippines Ukulele Project. You know, how did you start that? And what was what was the inspiration to that? I mean, did you play the ukulele as a child or? Um, actually, no. Uh, what happened is my mom is in the Philippines and she likes to help out the kids in the community there, making them shorts or giving them snacks and, and that sort of thing. And I've always wanted to have a pet project that was involved with children and with music. So I don't know what happened, but the idea came to me in the middle of the night and I Facebook messaged my mom and said, I have an idea, call me. She called me back right away and she always talks about that night. She says, I knew it was something important because you never say that, call me right away. And I called her and I said, listen, I have this great idea. Uh, I'd like to bring, bring instruments to the Philippines, you have all these kids that you're helping. Maybe we can group them together and I can find donors for the instruments, bring the instruments over to the Philippines and teach them to play. So we toyed with the idea of what kind of instrument to bring. And you know, violin would be impossible with the humidity and um, how challenging that instrument is. Pianos are too expensive, too heavy. Uh, guitars might be awkward for young players. The ukulele was actually a perfect choice. It's inexpensive. Uh, it is easy to tune, to repair. And the donors were told in the beginning, you know, when you buy this ukulele for this child, keep in mind that many of them, this will be the most precious thing that they have. Because for them to buy a ukulele like that, which may be $50 here, It requires almost two weeks of pay for most Filipinos, at least in the area where my mother's from. So the idea was also, I I wanted it to be good for both sides. It's going to be good for the child, but I also wanted it to be good for the donor. Because a lot of times we donate um, money or we donate things to organizations, we don't really know where it ends up. So I would have the donor pick out the ukulele. They would 
hold in. And then I would find a child that would match their personality in the Philippines because most of the donors I knew personally. And then I would take a picture of the child with the ukulele and then I would show it to the donors so they could actually see where their ukulele went. And they could even write a note to the child to encourage them you know, to continue with their education and to continue with music. And I thought that was just a great way to connect people from one side of the world to the other side of the world. I I love that initiative you started, and I love how you turned that idea and made it into reality, right? I mean, you just said, Mom, I have a great idea. Let's figure it out, right? Yeah. And, you know, the kids in the Philippines will have something to do, and you're right. You know, a $50 ukulele, that's like winning the lottery in the Philippines. You know, it's, you know, they don't make too, they don't make a lot. You know, they probably make like $5 a day if they're lucky. Um, the kids, you know, they don't get a lot of toys or anything to do with and being able to have this one item can make all the difference in the world right instead of you know going out there trying to get into trouble they're at home or they're with their with other students learning to play the ukulele um but i was just curious is there like what's the difference with a guitar and learning to play the ukulele like is it easier to play the ukulele versus a guitar yes i'd have to say it's uh the ukulele has nylon strings. Um, Some guitars do as well, but the guitar has a much longer neck and it has six strings. So with the smaller instrument and the strings that are a lot small, you know, a lot shorter, it's easier for the little hands to to hold. And, um, you know, their fingers don't have to do so much to create a chord. So we usually start off, you know, with a very simple tune, and then I might teach them a couple of chords and then they start teaching each other, which is which is what it's all about. I love that. For sooner or later, we're going to have a ukulele band from the Philippines. Oh. I'll go viral. <laughs> well, that, you know, it's it's interesting that you say that because you know people often wonder why um, there's so many Vietnamese that do nails. And if you look up the history of that, it was an American actress that went to Vietnam, and she encouraged somebody to to do nails, and and that it just kind of took off in that area. And that's why we have so many people of that Asian um, descent that do those sort of things. I'd love for that to happen with the ukulele. Yeah, anything's possible, especially if you're, you know, creating this project and having donors send ukuleles, like anything is really possible at this point. Um, You know, a lot of stars came out just from a viral video, right? Correct. Um, Like the lead singer of Journey, right? He came from poverty, like bad poverty, and look where he is now. You know, he sounds exactly like um, the the lead singer, and you know, he's touring all over the world, gets to hang out with one of the most successful bands in the world. So, anything can literally happen. Um, so, I actually wanted to ask you because I know you have many hats, and one of them is you're an attorney, right? And I'm just curious what got you into the law, like the law enforcement industry or the law industry, because I'm pretty sure that's something that's not typical. Like you mentioned, your mother wanted you to be a nurse, right? When you look at the stats, when it comes to representation of Asian Americans as lawyers, I think it's like less than 5%. And then when you see the ratio from men to women, it's probably, you end up saying maybe like, we're if we're lucky, one to 2% of Asian women are lawyers in, in the United States. But you personally, like, what made you get into law? And then the type of law that you're, you're um, that field in, you're in? Okay, so uh, I had the music store for many years. And I had a child, and then I had another child. And then you get to this point where you're, 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 you're totally putting out to the community and putting out for your business and you're, you're, you're building things and you're there for your children. And I really wanted something for me. And I, I love retail, but there's a part of my brain that really needs to be intellectually fed. And I got to that point where I said, if I don't go now, when am I going to go? And for some reason, the to study law was in it. And people always ask me when I was in law school, well, where do you think you're going to go after this? What do you think you're going to do with the law? And I thought, I'm, I'm not sure, but I feel like this is a calling and I'm going to go ahead and go with it. And I'm pretty sure it's going to present itself after I graduate. So going into law school, I wasn't quite aware that I was a minority. Um, I mean, I obviously am, but I don't, I don't look at it 
that way. I don't look around and, and think, okay, there's these people and that those people and everything. I go straight into it because I, I don't have time to, to worry about that or to, to think about that. And honestly, as a, as a woman and a minority and a, a single mom, I'm sure there's little, little roadblocks blocks that have come up in my life, but I don't worry about the roadblock being a roadblock because of how I look or who I am. I just look at it. Well, there's a roadblock. Let's get around it, over it, under it, through it. I don't want to waste my time thinking about what the other person is thinking about me. I want to move forward and, and do what I want to do. I love that. I know sometimes we feel like we're not good enough based on our cultural background, especially Asian women. You know, when you are told all your life, you're only good for making babies and getting married. It's like, that's your cap, but really we have no cap. If we put our mind to it, we can be anything we want to be, right? Like you being a, an attorney and having a music school and creating a nonprofit. And, you know, what was your family's reaction when you decided you wanted to get into law, like law school and become an attorney? Well, I, I think my family has gotten used to me doing certain things. And no doubt growing up, there was a lot of pressure to have good grades and to somehow miraculously do childcare and housework and be courteous and cheery and and magically get everything done in no time. And, and I did carry that into my adulthood, which in some ways was helpful, but in other ways, a little bit damaging to me. So there's this opening up and this um, acceptance of being who I am and letting letting go of those ideas that my mother had, and she had great ideas, but some of them were, you know, go to nursing school, uh, make sure, you know, everything is clean, know how to cook some, somehow magically, which is funny because I'm a terrible cook. We, we talk about it all the time. Um, and, uh, you know, get those good grades and then, you you know, have your husband and, and be there. And then growing up also in the 80s, we were told uh, women can have it all. Women can have it all. And we were, we were, we were taught, you can have the children, have the job, make all of the money, do all of this. It wasn't until recently I said, you know, it wasn't about having it all. It was really about making us do it all. And I, I don't want to do it all. I want to do these certain things. So I'm, I'm not going to be a nurse. The cooking thing, I, I think I can let that go and maybe focus on things that, that I want to do. But we, we, we are brought up to, to be a certain way. And, and some of us are, and, um, some of us aren't. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I just, I was listening to audio of my own family, um, you know, growing up in the Philippines and as a Chinese family, there was always a lot of expectations. Um, one of my grand aunts was telling me how she used to work at the bank and when she was about to marry my grandmother's brother, the only prerequisite for her was, can you speak Chinese? And do you know how to cook? Even though she worked at the bank, those are her only two prerequisites. And I was like, wow, you know, I mean, and I get it. That's how it was back in the day, yes. right? And, and the, pressure to, the pressure to marry is, yeah. it's, it's so extreme. It's so extreme. And to marry so young. And I feel I married young as an American. I married when I had just turned 23, which for Asian culture was old. I, w- yep. I, had, I was already fielding the questions for years as to why I wasn't married yet when I was only 19 or 20. And I think that's something, I mean, I understand people, people want you to have a family and to settle down. Uh, but, you know, just because we're Asian doesn't mean we're, we're going to do that. Maybe some of us want to put our careers ahead. Yeah, for sure. And, and, you know, I just wanted, I was just curious, what has your journey been like as an attorney, you know, especially as an Asian woman, um, you know, it's a male dominated industry. I know you mentioned you have your own firm. You never worked for any other firm, but for your journey, you know, what was it like? Did you ever go through, you know, microaggressions, uh, racism, harassment, sexism, or not be feeling like you weren't treated fairly because of your culture? I don't think it, I haven't been, um, treated unfairly because of my culture. I think more, and if I have, I, I, I did notice, uh, I have felt more of it being a woman and going into court and judges and attorneys seeing you for the first time and they're thinking, oh, well, this is going to be fun. And they smile at you. And then, but, you know, 
that starts off at the beginning. Once you start talking and the court case is going and you're arguing a motion or you're in trial, all that goes out the window and people will pretty much forget that you're a woman and that you're Asian because there's, if you're good at what you're going to do, they're, they're just, they just know that they're going to have to field questions or field cross examinations and examinations and, and they're going to have to answer back to your motions. So there, there's been more of a, I don't know, a situation where they think that I feel, I feel that they think that since I'm a woman, this is going to be an easy thing. And then if it's not an easy thing, it's, oh, it's, she's emotional. And I'm, I'm really not when it comes to law, but there have been a lot of times, I think in the past couple of years that I've, I've noticed certain things and it's not just from men, it's also from women. And I think to myself, you know, if I was a man, we wouldn't be having this conversation right now. And then I'm realizing, okay, I am perceived differently because of the, of the way I look. Yeah. yeah. I, that's, I, yeah, I totally get that as men, right? We wouldn't have, they don't have to go through most of things women go through, you know, just in general. Right. Well, yes. Um, but some of this, yeah. some of this comes from women as well. So yeah, that's true. In the workplace, <laughs> there's, 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 there's women who will say certain things and, and men will say certain things. They'll go, oh, you know, and I, and I think a lot of men are aware now that there are very powerful and, and wonderful women out there. But I'd like to see a little bit more tolerance from from the women to other women. So, yeah. you know, it's and one of the things is when you're working and when you're working, you're at work, you feel like a lousy mother because you're not, you know, preparing that home cooked meal and you're not there to tutor them after school. But then when you're with your children and caring for them, then you feel like a lousy worker because maybe you should be doing this extra thing or answering that email or making that phone call. So I had to let that go early on. And it's a very difficult thing to do as an Asian woman, because you're supposed to be perfect. Okay. The perfect handwriting, perfect grades, perfect, everything, perfect family life. And I had to say, you know what, I'm going to have to be happy being good enough as a parent and good enough in my career. And it's not really about perfection. It's just it's at, at, for some years, it's just about keeping my head above water. Yeah, I love that. And it's so true as women, you know, sometimes we can get catty with each other, mom guilt comes up, shaming. And sometimes you wonder why we don't advance as fast as men is because of these things. And as women, you know, we should all work together, we should all give support to each other, you know, be more compassionate and realize, I get it as a mother, it's hard. I get it. You're trying, especially as a single mother, right? Yes. Um, I'm pretty sure that wasn't easy as well. Being a single Asian mother from a Filipino household, I'm sure there was a lot of, you know, uh, talks. It's like, how could she do that? Why would she do that to her own daughters? How is she going to fend for herself? Um, you know, what's, what's everyone going to say? <laughs> you know, did what that- is everybody going to say? <laughs> and I remember my mother after after my divorce saying, you need to find, uh, you need to find a man. You need to find a man who's like a, like a president of a company or a doctor or something, you know, to take care of you. And and I'm, I'm thinking, mom, I'm a lawyer. Really? I, if anything, I need somebody who can cook, <laughs> who can take care of the kids. Okay. Who can take in my dry cleaning. I said, but, but okay, you want me to, you know, we had a little discussion about that and I, I think she's okay now. So it's, but it is this idea, even, even from my own parents. Oh, what is she going to do now? She's all alone in the world. And I think they've come to realize that I'm, I'm going to be okay. Yeah. And you're, you're certainly more than okay, you know, being able to do the things that you do and being a lawyer. I mean, that's a tough job on its own. (laughs) So like you being a lawyer, having a music studio, having a nonprofit, raising your kids as a single mother, I'm pretty sure everyone's like, how did you do all that? Right? What, what did you do? And I know you mentioned you, you can, you, about having everything all at once. Yes, you can have everything all at once, but not the same time. Right. Um, But yeah, what, how did, how were you able to do all that. <laughs> yes, I, I I understand. Okay, so uh, one of the things that I learned how to do early on is I have to delegate. And some of the delegation comes in the form of having somebody clean my house, which, <laughs> which is difficult because nobody's going to clean my house like I clean my house. But, um, you know, I look at it as extra help. 
And then once I was able to let that go, it's okay, I need preschool for my children. I need a manager at the store. I need somebody who can help with certain things. Um, so when I, when I was in school, if I had uh, a break off of school for two weeks, I would have somebody there. We would go through all of my paperwork. We would get caught up with everything. And it's just a lot of multitasking. There were times in law school where I was on my laptop and I was handling business emails while I'm listening to lectures. And sometimes my daughter would be sitting right next to me with her little kitty pink laptop open also um, at law school. I, I had to bring them sometimes. And I looked at it as I'm paying for this tuition, so I will bring my child as long as she's not a disruption. I think that should be okay. Can't do the same thing at court, but the kids have gone to court with me plenty of times um, to file paperwork. This was before pandemic, and it was easier to do then. They've come with me to the music store. Uh, they practically grew up here, so of course they play multiple instruments. I I just needed that sort of flexibility, and I I do all of these things. It's it's not that I do them all full force, um, and it's not that I. I do. I don't do it without any help. I have a lot of help. So I have employees that work for me for law. I have paralegals that are available. I have people that help me at home. Uh, so it's not so much about, there is a lot of doing, but there's also a lot of de- directing and there's also a lot of delegating. And there's a, also a lot of letting go and understanding that maybe if I'm giving this task that I usually do to somebody else, True, they might not do it as well as me, but there's only so many of me to go around. So I have to let that go and let others learn at their own pace and become experts in their own time. I love that. And I love that you mentioned asking for help because that's so important. And I know in our culture, it's like you can't ask for help. It's shameful. It's a handout. How could you? You're supposed to do it all. You're supposed to be the superwoman. But it's just impossible. We we live by these unrealistic standards right. and then we get burnt out and we don't feel good enough. So I'm glad you learned early on, like, you know, you can't do it all. You're going to ask for help and there's no shame in that. And so I just have one last question. You know, I'm sure the listeners loved your episode, loved your story, and they probably wanted to know, you know, what's the one piece of advice you would give to the listener who's maybe in a similar journey as you? I think the one piece of advice that I would have to say is to definitely make those connections with other people and to make them over short distances or long distances and uh, to share your story, especially with the younger people. I'm now realizing the importance of sharing my mother's story with my children. And also when I hear my mother talk about stories that, that have happened with her neighbors. And if I can give you an example, we ha- she has a neighbor in the Philippines and their little hut was flooded. So all of the little girls came to sleep on my mother's floor and she has a nice house. But I had to ask these neighbors, I don't understand how you recognize that getting an education and working would get you to where you are today. Because a a bunch of people just stay in the shacks and this family took themselves out of poverty. And the oldest daughter kept on saying, I just know I didn't want it to repeat. I didn't want to repeat. I wanted it to change. And I said to her, you wanted to break the cycle of poverty. And she said, yes. And I said, where did you get that idea? Because other people aren't doing it. So how come you're different? And I kept on asking and I kept on asking. She said she didn't know. She didn't know. I think I finally pinpointed it, which is when their hut flooded and the girls spent the night at my mother's house. My mother's favorite pastime is bragging about her children. My children have done this. My daughter, the attorney, she went to school. He went to school. They went to school. They studied. They worked hard. This family is entirely different. I truly believe because of their interactions with my mom and her explaining to them her pride in her children. And just that small interaction broke that chain of poverty for this family. So for everyone there, I think it's important to talk and to share your stories with others. I love that. And I'm, 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 you know, a big believer in sharing our stories, especially sharing our specific stories, because like you mentioned, it breaks cycles, it creates representation, it solves problems. You know, there's just so many benefits to it. 
And so it's a disservice that we don't share it. So I love everything that you mentioned. And I'm so excited. I'm so glad we got to connect and you're here on the show today. Um, so thank you again. So I want to thank our guest, Robin Sassy, for joining me on today's show. To learn more about Robin, please visit her website, robingenesassy.com. We would love to also hear from you, our valued listeners, about any suggestions for future guests or topics. Also, be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform, as well as follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Asian Pacific Voices Radio is produced by Asian Culture and Media Alliance, a nonprofit that empowers our Asian and Pacific Islander communities with a voice through media arts. If you would like to support our program, please visit AsianPacificVoicesRadio.com. I'm Sheena Yapchan, and thank you for listening. Please join us next week for another exciting and thought-provoking Asian Pacific Voices Radio show. Take care until then, everyone.